Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for joining me for this podcast. And I'm doing this in response to the latest dust up in evangelical circles. And it um, it dusted up this past November 22nd, 2021, when Dr. James Merritt tweeted this. He said, I don't agree with my loved son, Jonathan Merritt, on everything to be sure, but I encourage you to listen to his message on Mark 13. It is both brilliant and faithful to the gospel and the coming of Jesus. Okay, so for some background information, Dr. James Merritt is the pastor of Cross Point Church in Duluth, Georgia. He is a very well-known name within Southern Baptist circles. In fact, he served as the president of the SBC from the years between the years 2000 and 2002 and as of just a few weeks ago he was uh, announced to be a visiting professor on preaching and Christian leadership at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary located in Wake Forest North Carolina the president of which is Dr. Danny Aiken. Jonathan Merritt is a 39 year old author. He has uh, written a number of books, best-selling books, learning to speak God from scratch among them. He has written thousands of articles that have been published in various venues, uh, the New York Times, USA Today. He is a contributing author for the Atlantic magazine. Uh, He is a conference speaker, speaks at conferences all over the place, and he has been interviewed by multiple national media outlets, MSNBC, Fox News as well. So uh, he's, he's quite prolific in, in his writing, in his media appearances and speaking and all of this. And Jonathan does claim to be a Christian, an evangelical Christian. In fact, he has a Master of Divinity degree from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, the same seminary which his father, Dr. James Merritt, is now a visiting professor. Now, What has made this such news in the evangelical world is that Jonathan Merritt is also a homosexual. Uh, Jonathan Merritt had a encounter or whatever you want to call it with um, another homosexual man, a man named Azariah Southworth. Now Southworth was actually a host of a Christian television show back in 2006, 2007, around in there, apparently a pretty popular show at the time. But uh, then then a year or so later, uh, he came out of the closet and admitted that he was a homosexual. And in 2009, uh, Southworth and Merritt began texting each other. And it depends on which account you read of this, whether it's Jonathan Merritt's account or Ezra Southworth's account, but uh, as to who was... Uh, more aggressive and how it started and the um, how to say this delicately the the extent to which their physical relationship uh, went Jonathan has kind of a softer uh, version of it whereas Azariah's version uh, portrays Jonathan as as the uh, instigator and and the aggressor and went further but at any rate uh, I thought about putting links to these articles that you can read uh, but they're they're hard to read. Um, hard is hard for me to read. But um, nonetheless, what is indisputable is that um, Jonathan Merritt is a homosexual. Now he didn't come out of the closet officially until this past August the fourth, August fourth of 2021, is when he officially came out of the closet. But it was, a, I mean, it was a surprise to no one. I mean, it, it like everybody knew that Jonathan Merritt was a homosexual. So, uh, as you might can imagine, when a current pastor of a very large Southern Baptist church, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, comes out and commends to everyone publicly uh, on his social media a sermon preached by his son, who is out of the closet, a homosexual, and he describes this sermon as being faithful, brilliant, and faithful to the gospel, uh, this caused a lot of waves, and understandably so. So at this point, dear friends, let me say that my point in doing this video is not to 
not to cause anyone any pain or discomfort. And uh, certainly it is not my desire for the Merritt family at all. But this is in the public forum. Um, Jonathan Merritt has been public about it. Uh, and James Merritt in putting this tweet out, commending his son's sermon that he says is faithful to the gospel. Uh, he publicly put it out. And so in, you put this out in the public arena, it is open for public critique. Um, I, I have no doubt. Let me say this too, that uh, at least from what is on his church's website, according to their doctrinal statement right now, and uh, here are some screenshots from Cross Point's doctrinal statement on their website. Uh, they do say that homosexuality is a sin. Uh, he's clear about that. Even uh, since this, uh, in the last few days since November 22nd, and Dr. Merritt put that tweet up, uh, he has said that uh, sodomy is a sin. So he does say that sodomy is a sin. So I want to be clear about that. He's, he's not saying that it's not a sin. He's saying that it is, but therein lies the problem because this is emblematic of um, a liberal drift in the Southern Baptist Convention that all of the leaders of the SBC have assured us that is not happening. No, it's not happening. There is no liberal drift in the SBC. But um, something you need to know, and I've done a couple of videos on, on this, uh, on the social justice movement. I will put links to that down below in the description. You can watch these videos. But I've done a couple of presentations on social justice. And the basically the thesis, the theme of these two presentations is that the social justice train is bringing a lot of cars along with it. And one of those cars is the homosexual car. And once the engine of social justice gets into a church, it's bringing those cars along with it. And um, Dr. Merritt, has he's kind of got one foot in, one foot out. You might even say more than one and a half or whatever in uh, the social justice movement. And his son, Jonathan, is fully committed to the social justice movement. I mean, he is fully woke, to use that terminology. Now, the Southern Baptist denomination has always been very clear that homosexuality is sinful because that is the plain meaning of Scripture. The Bible teaches this very clearly, and despite some efforts in the last 10 years or so from some, uh, Matthew Vines and others, trying to uh, explain away the very clear meaning of the text in, in multiple, multiple verses in the Bible that clearly teach that homosexuality is sinful, despite some of these kind of uh, neo-Orthodox efforts, uh, it, there's really no amount of hermeneutical gymnastics you can do to get around the very clear, simple meaning of the text. The Bible absolutely does condemn homosexuality as a sin and states in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that those who, those who are homosexuals, those who uh, identify as homosexuals, uh, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And there's just no way of getting around this. So when you have uh, one of the more prominent voices within the SBC openly commending to people a sermon that he describes as faithful to the gospel preached by a homosexual, one whom the Bible describes cannot possibly be regenerate, cannot possibly be a Christian, and he commends that, then understandably so, this raises a lot of eyebrows. And so you had some uh, theologically conservative pastors within the SBC, theologically conservative pastors outside of the SBC, to really push back on this. And all of the pushback that I have seen has been firm yet respectful, has not been mean-spirited. Um, now, I'm not saying maybe some mean-spirited comments have not been or not out there somewhere, but from what I've seen from prominent voices within uh, the SBC, the pushback has been respectful yet firm, uh, and, and rightly so. And in response to the criticism that he was getting, uh, the next day, November 23rd, Dr. James Merritt put this up. He says, Regardless of who preaches Jesus or speaks truth, I rejoice when they do because I love Jesus and truth. I can approve a message even when I have disagreements with the messenger. I agree with Paul. 
Love rejoices with the truth, and that is the truth. So Dr. Merritt says he can approve a message even when he has disagreements with the messenger. Well, <laughs> talk about an oversimplification. Uh, I can approve, a, and I do approve, of thousands of sermons that have been preached by men with whom I have small differences, uh, small theological differences. Um, I have a different eschatology and a different view of baptism than does R.C. Sproul, but I still regard Dr. R.C. Sproul, the late Dr. R.C. Sproul, as um, one of the most faithful proclaimers of the gospel in the modern era. Uh, but th th so it's not about having 100% agreement on every little thing with anyone. But the, what we're talking about here, dear friends, these are not minor theological differences. According to Scripture, Jonathan Merritt is not a Christian. Of course, he proclaims to be a Christian, but as a homosexual, he is not a Christian. The Bible is very clear about that. And there's a Twitter account that responded to this and said sodomy is now merely a disagreement because that's that was his wording. And Dr. James Merritt responded to this. He said, sodomy is a sin. I disagree with anyone who says it's not. But notice the softening here. Notice the compromise. He says that not all gays are practicing. So the insinuation is, is that you can be homosexual, you can be a gay Christian as long as you don't act on it. Um, it's only when you act on it that that becomes a problem. But dear friends, that is a, that is a softening of biblical truth. And uh, any softening of biblical truth, let's call it what it is, it is error and it is sinful. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. When you read that text, when, when Paul says, for such were some of you, he has this list of sins. Do not be deceived. And this long list of sins, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexual, nor covetous, reviler, swindlers, and I'm doing this off of the top of my head, um, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That language there, such were some of you, that is strong language. And I'll also put a link to an article that will f more fully flesh that out down below in the description. But that is a clean break. If you are a Christian... That, that is a clean break from your previous identity. If you are a Christian, your identity is in Christ. Okay, There is no such thing as a gay Christian any more than there is such thing as a thieving Christian or a child molesting Christian or a murdering Christian. When, when you become a Christian, your, the, the identity that you had before Christ, B.C., that's been broken. That's been done away with. You are a, now a new creature in Christ. So um, there are no adjectives when it comes to being a Christian. You're either, you, you are either a Christian or you're not a Christian. But there's no such thing as a gay Christian any more than there is a murdering Christian or anything like that. So this is a softening of sin that is, that is part and parcel of the social justice movement. Another lady came to Dr. Merritt's defense. This is from Dana Hall McCain, and she says, I'm so grateful for the example of Dr. James Merritt and his precious wife, Teresa. They are people who love the Lord and his gospel and love their family with godly faithfulness and wisdom, privileged to know them. And notice that this was liked by Beth Moore and Ed Litton. Ed Litton is the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention, who is a serial plagiarist and liar. Um, I've dealt with that in some previous videos, and um, I'll, I'm going to have another video coming up on it. But notice uh, Beth Moore not only liked it, she even responded. She says, feel the, feel the same exact way, Dana. Well, he, he says, she says that Dr. Merritt loves his family with godly faithfulness and wisdom. Um, I have no doubt that Dr. Merritt loves his son. And this is where I want to, I want to be careful because uh, I know that it must grieve Dr. Merritt that his son is a homosexual. But dear friends, the reality of it is this. Oftentimes we can see things, we can see uh, sin issues in the lives of other people outside of our family very clearly. 
And if it were someone outside of our family, there would be no question, there would be no hesitation, there would be no confusion about it. We would see, see them very clearly, black and white, as the Bible intends. But when you bring that same sin issue inside the household, inside the family, and it, fit, and it affects one of our family members, our son, our daughter, our mother, our father, our brother or sister or aunt or uncle or grandmother, grandfather, whatever. When it comes and it hits inside our own home, then all of a sudden we lose objectivity and we begin to make excuses. We begin to try to um, create an out in our own minds. Well, it, it's, it, it's uh, but he's not practicing. But you know, we begin to make excuses. We would see it very clearly in someone else, but not when it comes to members of our own family. Uh, this is really a test of, of how faithful to Scripture we truly are. And I know, I, I know, I know that James and his wife Teresa love their sons, and they love Jonathan. I know that. But biblical love sometimes is tough love, right? And the most loving thing to do to to truly show uh, godly wisdom and, and godly love here is to tell Jonathan the truth. Uh, James should tell his son, son, you're a homosexual. You cannot be a Christian. You, you, scripture is very clear about this. And it is oftentimes that tough love when we tell our family members the truth, hard though it may be, it is, it is that hard truth oftentimes that God will use to bring them to a place of repentance. The worst thing in the world to do is to affirm someone, affirm a family member, when we, when we see that they are in habitual, unrepentant sin and yet claim to be a Christian, the worst thing we can do is to affirm that person and, you know, oh, we're, you know, we, we have some disagreements. We have some disagreements, but we're still, you know, we're still all Christians. That's the worst thing that you could do. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says that if there's any so-called brother who is in a state of habitual unrepentant sin, uh, Paul says, do not even eat with such a one. And there are no exception clauses to that verse unless they're a member of your family. Um, these are hard truths, but they are truths. And it is these hard truths from the Bible that serve as tests of our faith. Um, how much do we really love God? Uh, how much do we really believe his word? How willing are we to really stand on the truth of God's word, even when it costs us, and it costs us dearly, especially with members of our own family? Um, the kind of love that James is showing for his son Jonathan right now is is not biblical love. It is misplaced love. The loving thing to do would be for James to tell his son that he must repent. That you think you're a Christian, but you're not. Repent. There is freedom to be found in Christ if you will truly repent of your sin and place your trust in Christ. Um, you will pass from death to life. In fact, the text I've already mentioned, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, notice that Paul says, for such were some of you. Paul says, you were those things, but you're not anymore. You were a liar. You were a drunkard. You were a fornicator. You were uh, an idolater. You were a reviler, but you're not anymore. You were a homosexual, but you're not anymore. For such were some of you. And Jonathan, if by some chance you're watching this video, I do not hate you at all. Um, I have compassion for you. And Jonathan, if you will truly repent of your sin and trust Christ in his atoning work on the cross, if you come to him in a true godly sorrow over your sin, you can join that group of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, you can join the group of the such were some of you. You can join that group. 
there is freedom. Even the, the, the sin doesn't matter, dear friends, whether it's lying, whether it's thieving, thieving, whether it's theft, whether it's you know fornication, sexual idolatry of any kind, and homosexuality. You can be saved. You can have freedom in Christ. Now, I want to move to the other issue with this tweet. Uh, homosexuality and all of that and the softening and the compromise on that, that is problematic enough in and of itself. That is worrisome enough and that is uh, hugely concerning. It is a shame on the SBC and all those who who came to uh, Dr. Merritt's defense. But here's the other issue. is Dr. Merritt said that the sermon preached by Jonathan was brilliant and faithful to the gospel. Okay? Faithful to the gospel. Well, I want to show you some clips from that sermon because I've watched it. In fact, I've watched it three times now. So uh, I have a few short clips here. And in full disclosure, lest anyone think I'm taking anything out of context, I will put the link to the entire sermon, not only the entire sermon, but the entire service uh, down below in the description. You can watch the whole thing for yourself and you'll see that I'm not being uh, unfair. I'm not taking anything out of context, not twisting his words. But uh, I want to show you, I want to show you some clips from this service at Good Shepherd Church, New York City. This is Jonathan Merritt's church, uh, Good Shepherd Church, New York City. Here's how the service began. All are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all. Now you might have recognized that first lady. That is Savannah Guthrie. She is. Uh, hostess on the Today Show on NBC. So if she looked familiar to you, that's why. But notice uh, this intro here. Notice how universalistic it sounds. Well, that's because it is. This is a universalist church. So watch some more. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. So all are welcome in the family of God. All are welcome at God's table. Uh, doesn't even matter what sexuality you are. So this is a homosexual affirming church. Okay, never mind Romans chapter 1, what Romans 1 says about homosexual, homosexuality. Never mind what 1 Corinthians 6 says. Never mind what 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 says. No, we affirm everyone of all sexual orientation. So it's a it's a homosexual affirming church. Notice that that lady said also, she said, no matter religion. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. Okay, religion. So all are welcome at God's table no matter your religion. So Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, no matter your religion, all are welcome at God's table, all are welcome in the family of God. This is universalism, okay? Th this is universalism. And I went to the church's website, and unless they have it tucked away somewhere that I cannot find, dear friends, I honestly, I could not even find a doctrinal statement on the website. I, I couldn't even find a doctrinal statement. So this is a universalistic church. This is well outside, well outside of the pale of orthodox Christianity. And Jonathan Merritt is not just a visiting preacher. He wasn't a guest preacher on this particular Sunday. No, Jonathan Merritt is an elder at this church. Watch this. Good morning, Good Shepherd. Welcome to Digital Church. My name is Michael Redzina, and I'm one of the pastors here. Today, I have the honor of sharing with you uh, a little bit of an introduction to our guest preacher for the morning, Jonathan Merritt. Jonathan is a dear friend of mine. He is uh, on our elder board here at Good Shepherd, and he has preached many times. Okay, so not only is this Jonathan Merritt's home church, he is an elder, quote-unquote, at this, quote-unquote, church. Does James Merritt not know this? Of course he does. You think James Merritt doesn't know what kind of church his son attends and is an elder of? Of course he does. It's his son. So here you have a current SBC pastor, professor at, an S, uh, at a Southern Baptist seminary, former president of the SBC, affirming 
his son's church that is universalistic, doesn't even have a doctrinal statement. Oh, but let's affirm this and let's put it out for everyone. Commend it to everyone. Folks, this is bad. I'm telling you, this is bad. And the blowback that Dr. Merritt received is well deserved. This, You have crossed a rubric here. But I want to show you some clips from Jonathan's sermon that he preached out of Mark 13. But unfortunately for the disciples, Jesus was not always so tactful. In fact, Jesus could be kind of a buzzkill sometimes. Now, the context of this is Mark 13, and Jesus and the disciples were leaving the temple, and the disciples said, Teacher, behold, what stones and what beautiful buildings. They were remarking, remarking about what a beautiful structure the temple was, and Jesus says, said to them, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And so that is why Jonathan says that Jesus was a buzzkill. The disciples thought the temple was beautiful and amazing. And he said, oh yeah, um, not one stone will be left upon another. It will be torn down. So Jesus was a buzzkill. The next day, Jesus wakes everybody up so early to head back to the city and he's in such a hurry that they all skip breakfast. And Jesus, he's so hungry that he grows grumpy, which happens to the best of us. Okay, dear friends, Jonathan here said that Jesus was grumpy. Now, let's carry this out to its logical conclusion. If, if you're grumpy, then that means you're discontent. Okay, and discontentment is a sin. Complaining is a sin. Philippians chapter 2, uh, do everything without grumbling or complaining. So without saying it in so many words, Jonathan is here accusing Jesus of being in sin. If that's true, you've completely gutted the gospel. And this is a sermon that is faithful to the gospel? But on the walk, he comes upon a fig tree that doesn't have any figs to satisfy his hunger. So Jesus curses it. And then, wouldn't you believe it, the thing withers and it dies. He did this even though the text says it wasn't fig season anyway. Talk about an overreaction. Friends, this is bad. Jonathan said that when Jesus cursed the fig tree, that it was an overreaction. Again, this is an accusation of sin. If Jesus overreacted, then that means he acted improperly. That is sin. It, Jonathan completely misses the point of the text. Jesus was using the fig tree as an object lesson for the for the faithlessness of Israel and won't get into all of those details, but the point of the matter is is that when Jonathan says that Jesus overreacted, that is a direct affront to his deity. God does not overreact. Okay, that is that is an that is an accusation against Jesus of being sinful. You've completed, completely gutted the gospel. And yet, James Merritt, current SBC pastor and SBC seminary professor, says that this message is faithful to the gospel. Unbelievable. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Talk about a buzzkill. He just extinguishes the disciples' wonder right there where he stood. But buzzkill or not, Jesus is reminding them and us of a God-honest truth that we need to hear whether we like it or not. Nothing lasts forever. Everything constructed by human hands is temporary. The houses in which we live, the offices in which we work, even the sacred places in which we worship, they're all fleeting, no matter how much you love them. And so now we begin to see the point that Jonathan's sermon is kind of going towards. When Jesus said of the temple that not one stone will be left upon another, the real meaning here is not, is not coming judgment. No, the real meaning here is that Nothing lasts forever. So we have to learn to love the worlds in which we live, and when the time comes, to let them go. So love the things in your world. Love your 
home and your possessions and your family and all these things. Love them, appreciate them, but when the time comes, let them go. That's the meaning of Jesus' proclamation of coming judgment. Uh, Unbelievable. One way that Christians can follow Jesus' advice to keep watch is to wait for the literal second coming of Jesus when all things will be made right at the end of time. Now, before you dismiss this as silly or superstitious, let me remind you that there's a long history of Christians doing exactly this kind of watching and not just in times junkies. This view has long sustained Christians who've been stuck living on the bottom rungs of the ladder, yearning with froth and fever for a final end to all of the injustice and oppression that keeps pushing them down, down, down. And you see there, that, that is a, that's his social justice theology coming out. He, he reads in a church like this, a universalistic social justice kind of church, they read social justice into the text when it simply is not there. We can simply open our lives to the truth that just as the world is always ending, Christ is always coming again. The ground beneath our feet is ever quaking, and I'm sorry to tell you, that's not going to change. The world is always ending, but Christ is always coming, and you'll miss the second part if you become too focused on the first. And dear friends, that what you just heard, that is really the entire theme of this sermon. The world is always ending, but Christ is always coming. I don't even know what that means. I mean, the world is always ending, but Christ is always coming. Christ is not always coming. See, for for Jonathan in in a church like this, the gospel is just about the here and now. You know, it's just about, you know, yes, this life is temporary and nothing lasts forever, but... But Christ is always coming. The world is ending, but Christ is always coming. So it's just this this temporal, um, Jesus is just here to kind of help you have a better life. Not health and wealth. It's not, this church is not that kind of a church. But, uh, but just, um, you know, to bring about renewal and justice here for this life. And Christ is always present. He's always coming. Well, I mean, Christ, Christ is always present present but to say he's always coming that's not that's just not true that doesn't i don't even know what that means it doesn't even make any sense christ will come he will return on a day not that he's always coming like constantly always even as i'm talking right now he's always coming somehow in this kind of temporal beautification of things or something like that No, let's look at Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, Jesus, whom he determined having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. There is a day fixed in which Jesus will come. Not that he's always coming, that he will come and he will bring judgment with him. This is a this is a complete and gross misinterpretation of the text. I mean, you have to you have to work hard to come up with that kind of interpretation. But that's what happens. I mean, that's what happens when you've got your your social justice lenses on. That's how you read the Bible. And that James Merritt could say that this sermon was a faithful representation of the, it was faithful to the gospel. That is unbelievable to me. Watch this. You see, for God, the whole universe is a cosmic delivery room over which the Creator is always whispering, push, push, push. I don't even, I'm not even going to hazard a guess as to what that means. That's just weird. Weird. Um, Now let's get to the coup de grace. This last clip, uh, this is... Jonathan Merritt's understanding of what the gospel is. He's about to present the gospel. Here it is. So if you're facing the end of your relationship, or the end of your career, or the end of your youth, or the end of your dream, or the end of a life of someone you loved with your whole heart, 
then I hope you'll mourn with all you've got. But I also hope that you will receive the good news of today's gospel. That God, whose name is love, is waiting for you everywhere, even in the places you'd rather not go. That the Holy Spirit is hovering over the chaotic deep of your crumbling world, calling forth new life. And that Jesus is always coming, again and again and again, even in this terrible, wonderful time. So stay alert and keep watch, because you might just find yourself, even with a broken heart, staring out a window with wonder in your eyes, witnessing not just the marvels of human innovation, but the living God coming in the clouds of your ordinary life. Amen. That's it. That's the gospel that he presented. That is the gospel according to Jonathan Merritt, that God is God whose name is love is waiting for you everywhere. Uh, the Holy Spirit is hovering and Jesus is coming again and again and again. And then he says, Jesus is coming in the clouds of your ordinary life. Now that phrase, Jesus is coming in the clouds, that might ring a bell. That's from Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, which says this, actually. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Yes, amen. That's a real, literal second coming. Not according to Jonathan Merritt. You see, Jonathan Merritt just spiritualizes everything. Jesus is coming in, the, coming in the clouds of your ordinary life. Friends, that, that's, th this is not the gospel. There was not a shred of gospel in this entire sermon. And I'll, I, the link is down there. Watch the whole thing if you don't believe me. Not one hint of the gospel was in there. The word sin was not in the entire service. The only time you've heard the word sin in this video is if it's come from me, which it has. But it was not presented in Jonathan's sermon, not even in the entire service. And James Merritt, a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, says that this was faithful to the gospel? What in the blue-eyed world? And there is good reason that so many conservative pastors have, have pushed back on this. My goodness, shame on them if they had not done so. Friends, this is a line has been crossed here. A line has been crossed. And again, I, I wish no ill at all on, on the Merritt family. And I, two things, I want... James Merritt needs to show his son true love, true biblical love, by telling him the hard truths that he's not a Christian. As a homosexual, he's not a Christian. I want that for Jonathan Merritt. I want that. In fact, I have prayed for Jonathan Merritt. I have, and I will continue to do that. I want him to know the true bodily risen Lord Jesus Christ who will come back on a day with the clouds, and he will come in judgment. And unless Jonathan repents, truly repents, that will not be a good day for him. Um, this capitulation on homosexuality, the social justice train. Remember a couple of years ago, critical race theory? It was, go, it was adopted to be a, a useful analytical tool by the SBC. This is what you get, folks. All these cars, the egalitarian car, homosexual car, all these cars come along with it. The SBC is in trouble. The SBC is in real trouble. And the fact that um, some prominent voices in the SBC have come and rushed to James Merritt's defense. Danny Aiken, the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Ed Litton, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. who was a serial plagiarist and liar. Um, they've rushed to his defense. Big problems in the SBC. Big problems in the SBC. 
And for James Merritt to say that this was faithful to the gospel, and he's a preaching professor? Wow. Wow. All right, dear ones. Uh, hope that this has been, I don't know that I can say it's been encouraging, uh, but Paul says in, in Titus, he, in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, he says, teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. It's not an either or, it's a both and. We are to be teaching sound doctrine and refuting those who contradict it. All right. Till our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.